It has been 46 years since the Supreme Court handed down its decision in the landmark Loving versus Virginia case in which a Virginia law prohibiting Mildred Loving, who was black, and Richard Loving, who was white, from marrying because of their race was struck down. Well, today, interracial and interethnic relationships are more common than ever before. Joining us today is Catherine Lung and Eddie Nuaboku. Organizers of Loving Day, a day to celebrate and educate people about the landmark law. Edward, please tell me, did I pronounce your last name correctly? Yeah, you got it right. All right, thank <laughs> you. I so appreciate it. And I appreciate you both for joining me here today. Thanks for having me. Wow, us. have times changed? It seems, it just seems outrageous, right? That there was a law that kept people from marrying based on race. And here we are in a position to actually celebrate the change in this law. What inspired you to do this? Um, well, um, we have been volunteering for the Love and Day Project for a number of years now. I was founded by a fellow named Ken Tanabe, and it was funny how that happened because he was doing his uh, master's thesis in the Parsons School of Design, came across the case, wondered why no one had told him about it, and decided to form an organization that would propagate about the case. You know. Uh, Loving v. Virginia is one of the most important civil rights cases that you've probably never heard of. And so the Loving Day Project is an educational project which helps fight racial discrimination through education and build multicultural and multi-ethnic community. And we're doing it now for 10 years, actually. This, uh, we've had the 10th anniversary just this past weekend. I read that in uh, one of the judge's uh, remarks in, in making his decision, he said that uh, that the world had been divided by, by color, that there were countries that had white people, that had black people, that had Malay was actually one of the words that he used. And he used that as justification as to why that was an indication that the races should not marry and produce children. Uh, it, it, it seems, like I said, outrageous to think that somebody actually thought like that and legislated, um, made rulings uh, based on that, but it's not surprising. And we are still seeing that there are many, many people that still struggle with interracial relationships. Um, what are you finding in terms of the response, uh, Catherine, to people who, who do decide to attend uh, the, the, the programs that you have to educate about mm -hmm. this landmark decision? Well, like you said, there are a lot of people who still are against interracial relationships and think that they're wrong. Every like year or so, you hear about someone refusing to marry an interracial couple for those very reasons. Um, but the kind of people who come to our events hosted by our organization are very open about talking about race and multi-ethnic identity, um, not just in their own personal lives, but also in society as well. And the country now has, uh, it's estimated, 8.4% of all current U.S. marriages are interracial. But we are, we're seeing where interracial relationships are still making uh, significant changes and movement in other countries as well. I mean, there are some countries that are kind of going through, South Africa, for instance, what we went through 40 years ago. Uh, are there lessons to be learned in terms of what was the effective way to, to, to change public sentiment uh, that can be applied elsewhere? Well, I think the Supreme Court case in itself is a very effective tool in that it is a symbol. Yes, Richard and Mildred Loving fought very hard and we should commemorate their trials, um, but there are many other people who helped them get there other interracial couples who fought their cases in other states before them, also the help of the American Civil Liberties Union, which ha had the lawyers who fought their case. Um, so using the loving Supreme Court case, or even South Africa, Nelson Mandela, like using rallying behind those symbols as means of fighting racial prejudice, fighting oppression, um, and being proud of who you are and, and who you're able to love. And I know it's not, it's not fair to assume that when we talk about interracial relationships that we're only talking about African-American or white. I mean, it certainly applies mm -hmm. you know, across races. And then we're also talking about inter-ethnic uh, marriages as well. Where are you seeing the most amount of acceptance when it comes to interracial relationships? And the most, uh, the, this seems obvious, the most amount of resistance, obviously, I'm going to assume, is between black and white. Well, um, it's, it's hard to say. I'll, I'll give you a, a personal case study. I'm just coming back from Houston, uh, where I attended a wedding of a black woman and an Indian man. 
Indian from India. Mm -hmm. And a couple of days after that, there was another wedding that I couldn't attend, unfortunately, and that was in Orlando, and it was opposite. Uh, she was Indian, he was black. So in my own personal uh, opinion and expectation, it, it's like that's one of the most, uh, fa the fastest growing demographic, Asian and black, which is, which is rather interesting. Uh, the Pew Research Study uh, has done some research, and so I don't have the figures off the top of my head, unfortunately, but they've done research into that as well. Yeah. And also the regions of the United States where it's you know, fastest growing as well. Yes, well, um, generally we find that in our, through our events and also through the community that, that cities on the coasts have a higher population of interracial relationships and multi-ethnic individuals, also um, other large metropolitan areas across the country. Um, Obviously, there are interracial relationships everywhere, but yes, in the coasts, it seems it's M most, more prevalent, most official, more common. Yeah. And how are you seeing that? How are you seeing the the, the increased uh, popularity, the increased number of interracial relationships? How is that transcending um, politically? Is there additional political power uh, in having this diverse uh, community? Absolutely, I think there's strength in numbers. Um, certainly where in interracial relationships and politics have merged more recently in the news is um, John McCain's son and John Boehner's daughter both married um, to African people of American. color. Yeah. Right, um, so there, that aspect is per permeate. Permuting in politics. Yeah, and I think what was so interesting about uh, the, the the marriage of uh, John McCain's son and his African American wife, who was also, uh, I believe, a, a service member, as is John McCain's mm -hmm. son, That's right. is that in, in addition to John Boehner, who, whose daughter married uh, a man, of, actually he's not African American, he's of Jamaican descent. Mm -hmm. uh, I think what was so fascinating about the optics of that picture is because they represent, uh, as Republicans, they represent a demographic. Um, and, and a group that has not necessarily been the most attractive to people of color. So to have uh, two uh, Republican statesmen see that on a personal level, uh, what entered their family were, were individuals that aren't necessarily represented, represented in the voting box mm -hmm. in terms of uh, voting for Republican, that certainly made the optics of, of that uh, that much more uh, interesting. Are there specific goals, though, with regards to to your Loving Day project that you hope to accomplish, say, within the next year or five years that you don't think are being currently accomplished now? There's specific things that you want to, to well, do with the project. Well, sure. You know, we're an educational project. Our primary goal is to educate people about Loving View Virginia, its importance in American civil rights history, and how it's having its impact felt not only in the United States but across the world. It's a touchstone uh, civil rights uh, case. And we feel that not enough people know about it. So that's primary. Uh, secondarily, we're trying to have the Loving Day celebration as a grassroots celebration that's celebrated not only across the United States but across the world. We're trying our best to make sure that June the 12th, which is the anniversary of the Loving Decision, is made an official national public holiday. It would be very nice if Mr. President, who is himself, of uh, product of an interracial marriage sure. would make that so. So we're fighting for that as well. And we, we try our best to help build multicultural, multi-ethnic community. There are a number of other grassroots organizations throughout the United States, uh, Maven, Swirl, Mixed and Happy, who are also fighting for the same goals and we've considered them allies in what we're trying to achieve. All right. Well, thank you both, Catherine and Edward, for joining us today to talk about Loving Day. I mean, just the title in and of itself should make you feel warm and fuzzy. It's and, so perfect. And, and, and romantic. We certainly thank you for joining us here on thank Our you. Take. Thank you for having us. And you are watching Our Take.